Um, I want to give credit to my co-authors, particularly Scott Ball, who's the chief of the reconstruction service at UCSD and who does most of these patients, the actual hip replacement. And also uh, Salil Upasanis, who is here, is here on the faculty with us. Uh, I work at Radio Children's Hospital San Diego, and we are the children's hospital for the University of California Hospital. And we do not do the procedures at our hospital. We transfer them to our colleagues. My training in managing hip surgery in children was fairly traditional with Ponsetti in Iowa City, Salter in Toronto, and then David Sutherland, who was the chief of our service before I took over from him. All were experts in children's hip surgery, but I was left with the idea that you should do your very best in a young child because once they were growing, there would be nothing more that could be done other than perhaps a hip fusion or a total hip replacement. Fortunately, I was introduced to the ideas of Gans, and these were further uh, uh, put into my mind by Professor Siebenrock, who's been very kind in guiding education to many people from San Diego. We had him join our faculty for the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons instructional course lecture, and we were able to have three people, Dr. Weinstein from Iowa City, who was here last year, and myself, and then uh, <coughs> Klaus to bring in some of the ideas about hip preservation surgery, which we are uh, strong advocates of. We also have had many colleagues from here coming to San Diego to be with us for short times. And fortunately, two of the people that have trained with me, Dr. Ernie Sink as a fellow and Dr. Upasani as a resident, are now on the faculty here. So why do young children have uh, problems with their hips and why would anyone under 30 need a total hip replacement? The typical reasons you see on the left, DDH, Perthes, Slip, JRA. And then almost as common or more common now in our institution are patients who have leukemia with steroids and avascular necrosis and the other rare causes. What should be done for a person according to age is a bit puzzling. This is Whistler, the American artist, who the model couldn't show up for a day, so he put his mother on his most famous picture. And this shows her at 65, and what many 65-year-olds were like in the past, and maybe a little bit now. And then we see this dynamic uh, young uh, lady from uh, Italy, who at age 65 may be quite different, and their expectations for what you would do for them are probably different. Similarly, teenagers have been proposed as good candidates for hip fusion. Uh, it might work on someone who led a really quiet life, but a quiet life person such as this is probably from a, perhaps a sophisticated family and wants to be a musician and active in life, so hip fusion may not be a good uh, candidate. She might not be a good candidate for fusion, and of course an extremely athletic person might not be happy with the fusion. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we evolved through these different childhood diseases and what we're doing at the current time. Options for Perthes disease are multiple, and you understand all of them and the different characteristics, including hip fusion, which we did many cases in our hospital up until about seven or eight years ago when I attended a conference in France where they said, in France, we no longer do hip fusions in childhood. And they explained a lot of psychosocial, perhaps sexual reasons, which I didn't fully understand. But strangely enough, we've now joined the French, and we no longer do hip fusions in children under 20. Treatment options for a slip patient, you can see here, are many. And if you do the correct type of uh, anatomic reduction, you can have an excellent result, but occasionally it doesn't go well. We study, studied <coughs> uh, 60 patients or 66 hips from our institution and UCSD age 12 to 29 years and divided them into two groups, the primary total hip arthroplasty patient and those who had a conversion total hip arthroplasty, that is an effort was made to have some type of reconstructive surgery, which we recommend in almost every case, but then failed to achieve a good result. This would be a typical patient who had a primary total hip replacement, uh, a person, I believe, in their young 20s who had uh, an epiphyseal dysplasia and had very successful bilateral total hip replacements. And in the conversion patients, a typical case would be someone who had treatment for subcapital femoral epiphysis, who had the unfortunate complication of uh, avascular necrosis and was treated with hip replacement. Our primary outcome was to compare the early results and the complication rates between these two as to whether this should guide us in early or later conversion to a total hip as to whether the complication rate would be different. This, of course, included assessment of major complications noted here as well as minor complications. 
The history of this treatment is well noted to you. The first important study in America was from Rancho de Los Amigas in California, where they said there was a 45% failure rate at 15 years, and likely almost all of these were typical Charnley type of cemented prostheses. Clohissi and his group did a, a systemic review meta-analysis showing that this changed rather remarkably, uh, remarkably with uh, change to cementless fixation and at that time ceramic on ceramic surfaces. And the French, or, or, or in Geneva, sorry, uh, the Germans in Geneva, uh, uh, gave this uh, report demonstrating a 10-year revision rate for 10%. Uh, complication rate. So things were markedly improving and we're going to rely a bit on their data regarding longevity because we do not have a lengthy follow-up on many of our patients. The longest was 12 years. There had to be a minimum of two-year follow-up. So durability is not really studied well in this group. Typical study methods, data collection, demographics, radiographic analysis, and then results. Uh, you can see who the patients, where the patients came from. You can see AVN due to steroid use and JRA as the preponderance of those uh, with primary total hip replacement because very rarely do you find specific circumstances where uh, <coughs> hip preservation surgery will help. Whereas you can see it, it is across the board for the conversion total hip uh, patients who, who had the typical childhood diseases who didn't always respond to our, our hip preservation events. Um, the <coughs> surgery require the complication rate is noted here with major complications being substantially greater in the conversion patients, but not actually statistically significant. So you can see the 5% that required for revision surgery, none were in the total hip replacement group, and several were in the conversion group. The same is true of the complications. <coughs> the retained implant proved to be, as the prior speaker has mentioned, the important uh, variable that was statistically significant. And this was, is important and a, a, a point that we want to make. Typical example of a patient with uh, an attempted hip fusion. In our later years of hip fusion, we moved to this anterior plating method to try to save the greater trochanter and the muscles laterally so if, to make a conversion to a total hip more feasible. This patient, unfortunately, did not have the metal taken out ahead. It was taken out at the same time of the total hip replacement. The patient had an infected total hip, replaced it with antibiotic beads, and had a difficult course. So with and without primary implants, you can see a rather significant difference between the two and leading to our recommendations, which I'll state at the end that the, your implant should always be removed if you do revision surgery, no matter how positive you are about the longevity of the hip. I would mention that well-designed and executed teenage hip surgery, hip preservation surgery is effective. And so although this surgery may look a bit odd in how it was implemented on the right, the child had an excellent outcome, whereas on the left, it was hopeless to consider that sort of approach. Uh, similarly, this child <clears throat> with a prior perthase disease with marked greater trochanteric overgrowth had a mortuary osteotomy, excellent alignment and function. And so in every case, we will try some operation rather than proceeding to total hip. A few example cases to show what we're faced with in a children's hospital. 16-year-old with Lemire syndrome, which is a sepsis involving superior vena cava. We see one about every two years. Extremely severe. Most of these patients die. But with appropriate modern ICU treatment, they will survive. And then we're left almost like infants, who you can find sepsis in all, almost every joint of the body. And you need to look carefully, because this patient had it in their wrist, in their ankle, and also not recognized in the hip for, for, until with a delayed diagnosis due to the fact the child's intubated for some time. Aggressive treatment was carried out. However, as might be expected, there was destructive arthritis and pain. This was a big, strong male, quite athletic, a bit rural, and we thought he would be a good candidate for a, total, for a hip fusion. Again, using the anterior, very large 6.5 synthes plate contoured in the appropriate position. And thought we were developing a, significant, uh, a successful hip fusion. In fact, made a video and had the residents look at him to show how well you could function with a, with a total hip without too much notice of bad gait, as Watson Jones did in his famous video many years ago where he compared women walking across the stage, one with out a total, without a fusion and the other with a fusion. So the, he had good function for about a year and then suddenly he started to have pain. 
And we've seen a couple of these now that have fractured their plate. And I'm wondering there, if they're maybe just getting their abductors in shape so that they'll start working again when we do the total hip for them. In any case, this was converted to a total hip. I think it had one fix, some fixation failure, but he had a good result over time. Another patient, child with DDH with failed prior closed reduction. When you later have avascular necrosis, you usually look to see whether or not they had any when they were first referred to you. So you can blame the process on, on someone else rather than yourself. So looking at the left femoral head, you can see there may be some delayed ossification. Typical Salter type of procedure, anterior open reduction, derotation osteotomy, Salter anomalous osteotomy. And as in many diseases, if things are done well and you don't have any complication along the way, you can have a great result. This child did very, very well on the right and continues even nine years afterwards to have excellent results. However, on the left side with AVN, there's coxa magna, anterior overgrowth. He was treated with a triple greater trochanteric apophysiodesis probably overcovered and impinged anteriorly and laterally, developed significant severe pain, and then later was converted to a total hip without complications. Um, <clears throat> the uh, last is a case of stable slip. And as you know, uh, a stable slip is simply treated with an in situ pinning in most of North America. And a big issue is whether, how quickly they must come to the hospital. One thing we now tell all patients is they should go in a wheelchair rather than go on crutches. Most of these patients are heavy. And if you give a heavy patient who lives on the third floor of an apartment without an elevator a pair of crutches and tell them to be sure to use them on the way to the hospital, they'll usually arrive looking like this, which is an acute unstable slip before they arrive to see us from the referring hospital. Unfortunately, this is an unstable slip, but treated with modern uh, Swiss methodology as well as we were able to apply. It works almost always only always here in Bern. Uh, it worked almost always for us, but in this case, despite good pinning, there was early signs of avascular necrosis, and we did bone grafting of the uh, area, replacing the pins, but unfortunately there was further collapse, and the child then had uh, further uh, treatment with a total hip with excellent follow-up. So, does previous surgery adversely affect the subsequent total hip? Probably not so much if the metal has been removed, but any surgeon faced with the possibility of treating one of these hips versus the other would probably know which he would prefer to do the total hip on. So lessons we have learned is to consider staging the surgery for removal of hardware. And everyone who does surgery in young children, no matter how perfect you think the result is, and I think Catterall and many others insist on this as well, the metal should always be removed, as was demonstrated by the Turkish study. Use tried and true predictable implants, and I don't know exactly what those are, so I don't have to talk about uh, disclosures here. We just know that it should be a stem with a proven track record. A ceramic head and a poly liner is our favorite. Others may prefer others. And this is an example of how that might look, and I am not even sure what the brand is, so I am free of any worries about advertising. So in summary, a total hip in a young patient. In every patient, no matter how severe the disease, other than perhaps a, a, a severe rheumatoid or um, uh, avascular necrosis, we will try hip pres preservation surgery procedure first. We have interesting, with very severe AVN, we sometimes will rotate the femur and put the, 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 almost the stump of a missing femoral head into the acetabulum in a young child, and some of them do remarkably well. We also do trap door procedures open. Uh, and cheerily, I've not done it always with a hip dislocation, as you've seen here. We no longer do hip fusions on any, any patient because we think the early results seem good enough if you have to end up with a total hip that they're probably the best choice. We remove all hardware from hip preservation attempts, and we refer our cases to a surgeon who we know who's specifically interested in children, and when he greets the family, they know that they're seeing someone knows, that knows how to deal with the many difficulties that were presented in the previous paper. Thank you very much.